So, uh, hi everybody, welcome, and uh, so we are very happy to have uh, today our friend uh, Jan Estaven, who is a professor at uh, EPFL Lausanne for how many years now? Five, six years? Well, I would say like this, enough years that I should be able to do this in French, <laughs> but I will do it in English. Okay. Eight, eight years, I think. Eight years already. Okay. So the subject will be structure preserving reduced order modeling. We are eager to hear this. <laughs> well, thank you, Juan, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I would have to admit I would rather have spent a weekend in Paris, but uh, <laughs> I guess these are not the times. <laughs> so uh, I'm very happy for the opportunity. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about work that we've been doing, doing actually over a number of years on, on trying to understand how to, how to develop uh, reduced order models uh, for time dependent problems um, with structure. So very quickly you will see that we will basically uh, focus on Hamiltonian problems. Um, but I'll start sort of very, very uh, briefly just to give a motivation for what happens if you don't if you don't do things. So, um, so just to get everybody on, uh, on the same page, what is a reduced order model? Well, we're, we're, we're looking for models where we would like to solve a PDE or an ODE, uh, typically PDEs, uh, that is parameterized in some way. Uh, mu, uh, mu can be a uh, high dimensional parameter space. And we are interested in the output of the of the PD, so so of course there's a we could solve the PD. There's a there's an equation that connects implicitly the parameters to the output of interest, uh, but doing this uh, comes at high cost, and we would like to solve the problem or develop a model that allows us to solve the problem for different parameter values uh, rapidly. So this is the idea of a reduced order model. Uh, the type of models that we would work on are reduced basis methods. Uh, which to a large degree was pioneered by Yvonne Madej and uh, Tony Patra uh, maybe, two, maybe two decades ago, a long time ago. Um, so, so if you look at an ODE or, or a semi-discrete PDE, we have L being the linear operator, F being a nonlinear part. Um, the solution set is an RN, N is very large, number of degrees of freedom. And we'd like to look for a reduced model basically by making an assumption that we can represent our solution set as a linear combination uh, of, a, of a small number, hopefully, a small number of uh, vector, vectors uh, in A. So this is a tall and skinny matrix um, with a small number of, of uh, coefficients Y. And, and of course, the assumption here is that uh, the dimension of set is much, much bigger than the dimension of Y. Um, now, if this is possible, well, then what we are basically doing is we are asking ourselves if we have a solution manifold with P being a particular parameter value, is it possible to represent this using some sort of linear uh, approximation to the manifold um, and then use that? So, of course, finding this linear space is, uh, is key. But let's imagine that we have it, that we have somehow it was given to us. Well, then we can put this into our ODE or our semi-discrete PD uh, as on top, as on top, uh, and then uh, effectively do a Galerkin projection, and then we end up with a system of, of ODEs, in this case, which uh, has uh, K degrees of freedom that we can now solve, and this will give us uh, the time evolution of the coefficients in the reduced space uh, under parameter variation. And, and again, if indeed the, the vector y is short, then of course there's a potential for uh, considerable computational savings. And clearly uh, choosing this linear space A is key. And then there are basically two ways of doing it. One is with a, with a proper orthogonal the composition, you, an SVD where you take a number of snapshots over parameter space, computes the SVD, and takes the dominating left vectors, and this is your space. And another way, which is uh, much more attractive, 
is a greedy approximation where you build the space one solution at a time uh, based on some uh, error estimator that you would need to develop and, and which will be uh, problem dependent. So these kinds of methods, especially for, 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 for steady problems, uh, uh, Navier-Stokes even, uh, but certainly Poisson problems, Maxwell's equations and so on, have been developed with great success over the last uh, 20 years. Um, and they generally work very well. Uh, now, when does this work? Well, of course, there's basically an assumption that, that as you change the parameter, the solution varies smoothly. This explains why we can hope to uh, approximate the solution manifold with a, with a low dimensional basis if we can find the basis. So uh, this is where the, either the PUD or the greedy comes in. So if we go ahead and do this for something as simple as the wave equation, so here's the wave equation, the, the accurate solver, if you will, the one that gives us the snapshots is a final difference method in this case. Um, simply solve it exactly as you, uh, as you would imagine. And the snap, the, the, the parameter here is time. Okay, so we pick snapshots in time. You um, project onto the basis exactly as you have a Galerkin projection. You put it in and very quickly you see that uh, the scheme is unstable. Um, now, if we do something a little more complicated, here's the shallow water equation. It's a, it's a two-dimensional nonlinear hyperbolic conservation law. What I show is the, is the solution with 80 modes, so K is 80, 80 modes in the, in the reduced model. And what you see after a while is that, again, it goes unstable. Um, now, you could speculate maybe this is caused by uh, the solution being so under-resolved that um, because of nonlinearity, this drives the, the, uh, the instability, perhaps. So it's natural to ask yourself, what happens if I simply double the number of modes? So now I should get a solution which is much more accurate. And all that happens is that it blows up faster. So if you worked in sort of time-dependent ODEs or PDEs for a while, uh, you know that when this happens, when you refine a model and it blows up faster, it means that the model is unstable. And so the question is why? What, what is happening when we go for, 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 uh, for an accurate solver, the full solver, which gives us the snapshots, uh, which is perfectly stable? Uh, we pick snapshots, we do the Galerkin projection, and now that scheme is unstable. Uh, it's clearly not an accuracy problem, so it's a stability problem. Um, so the, so the, the, um, the theme of the discussion here is to try and understand uh, what, what goes wrong and, um, and then how can we fix it. Um, but before that, we can just make a few observations saying that, for instance, uh, the projection-based methods, which is the one I, I just uh, illustrated, clearly work very well for elliptic harmonic problems, where the main concern is the accuracy. You choose the basis in the PUD or in the greedy based on an error estimator, it gives you accuracy, and it doesn't really talk about stability. Um, and this, of course, becomes now an issue when we begin to talk about time-dependent problems. And, and, and also, um, as we've seen, that even if the high fidelity solver that we have is stable, the reduced order model is not. Uh, so this is something that we, that we have to, to think about, uh, to solve. And, and as, as many of you will know that when you're solving a PDE and you're looking for an appropriate simulation or appropriate discretization, you basically have two tools in your hand. You can either talk about how you represent the solution and then do, say, a Galerkin projection, or you can, you can ask yourself, uh, I want to represent my solution in a particular way, but can I satisfy the equations in a different way? So Petrov Galerkin is a, is, a, is a classic example. And there's quite a lot of work uh, around where people go the way of the Petrov Galerkin. So you try to look for, for a test space that allows you to come up with a, with a, with a stable reduced order model. I'm not going to do this. 
I'm going to ask if I can uh, maintain the um, the Glurkin formulation, um, but perhaps change my my space in such a way that the scheme is stable. Um, so uh, I look at three different types of problems that sort of gets to the bottom of it in, in a variety of different ways. So we'll start with canonical Hamiltonian problems. Uh, then we'll look at more general Hamiltonian problems. Uh, so with the general uh, Poisson structure. <clears throat> and then at the end, we'll discuss how to do all of that, but with a nonlinear basis. And we will see uh, soon why we need to do something like that uh, for these kinds of, of problems. Uh, so this is work that has been done uh, here at BPFL over the last uh, few years. Uh, Babak Mabudi is a former student of mine, is now in Stuttgart. Uh, Cecilia Pagliettini was a postdoc of mine. She just moved to uh, Eindhoven. And Nicola Ripamonti is a current uh, student of mine. So, so I will emphasize where they have been involved. So let's look at the, at the, uh, at the canonical problem first. Okay, so, so the problems that we saw, both the wave equation and also the shallow water equations, can in fact be written on Hamiltonian structure. So it means that they preserve the energy, or at least this is one interpretation. Um, and uh, so if you sort of a one page uh, Hamiltonian dynamics here, so you can write Hamilton's, oh, the, the, uh, the conjugate variables for Hamilton's uh, equations, H is the Hamiltonian, uh, Q is the position, P is the momentum, and you can think of H as the energy. Uh, then these are the equations. If you write them as a as a system of of, uh, of ODEs or PDEs uh, in a in a simple way, you get the structure below. Y y dot equals J um, gradient H, and J is this uh, skew symmetric uh, matrix which is the one that, that uh, is going to give us uh, energy conservation. So this is the classic Hamiltonian problem. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask myself, can I, can I construct a basis? Can I construct the reduced basis in such a way that the scheme is uh, stable by construction? Um, so in order to do this, I will define this notion. It's not my definition. It's, it's, it's something that has been studied uh, a bit here and there um, about a symplectic basis. So a symplectic basis, A, so A again is a, is a tall and skinny matrix. J is the, is the skew symmetric matrix, either of size 2n or 2k. And if A, is, is, uh, if A satisfies this constraint, we call A symplectic. And in a minute, you will see why this constraint becomes relevant here. Um, and so A has vectors, which will basically be uh, E and F, if you will. So one basis for the position, one basis for the momentum, and they have to also satisfy um, the skew symmetric constraint. Uh, and they will, and, and we will use this when we construct the basis. So uh, the uh, symplectic matrix has a number of interesting properties which was uh, proven five, six years ago, um, that for instance, uh, you can define a pseudo inverse and the pseudo inverse is also symplectic. Uh, and this we will, we, will, uh, we will use. Now, why is this important? Well, let's get back to the problem we're trying to solve. We say, okay, we can express set our solution as a linear combination of, of A times Y. Put it into our Hamiltonian problem. Uh, we do a Galerkin projection, and you would see at the bottom that what you're left with on the, on the right-hand side is uh, the pseudo-inverse J, pseudo-inverse transpose. Now, if A is symplectic, then that is exactly J. And we are back, and you recover at the, at the reduced level, you recover uh, a, 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 a reduced model which has the right structure. Now the Hamiltonian is slightly different, uh, but this you can control by the accuracy of the um, of the basis. So this is why this 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 constraint on A 
becomes essential because this is what allows you to guarantee that the reduced model maintains its structure. Okay, so 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 then we are back to the to the key question is well how do I find this basis? And uh, again, the tool that we have is say okay I'm going to solve the full problem for a number of of times snapshots, and then I'm going to look for the a that that uh, minimizes the error subject to the constraint that A is uh, symplectic. Okay, so if you if you think of, of what would happen if it's not symplectic, well then then the J's will be I's and you would basically say A should be orthogonal and you would be back to the S V D. But here it's a more complicated, it's a nonlinear optimization problem. So this is one way of solving it. Uh, but there are other ways that are simpler. Uh, you can use SVD-based methods. You can also use, in particular, you can use a complex SVD. Um, but in fact, we use a greedy. And and uh, and in this particular case, but and there are other ways of doing it. In this particular case, we use the fact that the Hamiltonian is uh, conserved, so you can look, you can use, you can use the Hamiltonian as a as an error estimator. Uh, this doesn't work all the time. Um, but uh, but in the examples that I show, uh, it does. Um, okay. Now, of course, if you do this, then then you know that by construction you are back to a Hamiltonian system. It's a different system. It's a different Hamiltonian problem because it has a slightly different Hamiltonian. But you can you can use the greedy to choose how accurate you want the Hamiltonian to be. And once you have that. If you do uh, a proper time integration, then the scheme is stable by construction. And that's exactly what we see here. The wave equation that blew up uh, a few minutes ago now, of course, runs very well. The arrow, if you will, in the Hamiltonian is 5 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, and uh, the, the reduced system is, uh, is 30. Um, so this, you have recovered the stability by construction by choosing the basis carefully. Um, now, what happens for nonlinear problems? Well, actually, nonlinear problems uh, um, we don't we don't have we don't have a, a complete story for the nonlinear problems, but we have something that works uh, very well. Okay, so again, you do the nonlinear problem, you seek an, uh, uh, an empirical interpolation as, as everybody else does, so you get the the scheme here. Um, now you would you would like that the uh, nonlinear term also after um, after time or after I'm uh, has a Hamiltonian structure, and this you can do approximately. This is not exact by choosing the space the space that you use to approximate the nonlinear terms exactly as as written here. Okay. Now if you do that, then a lot of the algebras um, um, simplifies, but it's not exact. So what we see is that if your if your representation is if this was exact, then that would mean that when you ran the code, even with a very coarse representation, it would not be unstable, but rather just not be accurate. Whereas in fact it is unstable. So this this is not an exact solution, but the reality is that it works extremely well uh, by by uh, by driving down this arrow. Um, so just to show you the shallow water equation, now that we can at least approximately deal with the nonlinear term. Uh, so here's the Hamiltonian formulation. Um, and here are two solutions. One is the one is the full is the full solution. So um, the spectral method, which is what we're using, and the other one is the um, reduced order model with 80 modes. And uh, there is no visible difference in the two. Okay, so you have recovered accuracy and we can see the top one is the first, is the full one and the bottom one is the reduced. So you can reduce the, the um, 
you can recover accuracy simply by choosing the, the, the basis correctly, carefully, so that you guarantee that you get a, a, a reduced power, which has the right structure. And if we look at the arrows, again, so just we can just look at the right-hand side, is this the Hamiltonian, so that the, the blue line is the Hamiltonian, if you just use PUD, and, and as expected, it explodes after a few time steps, uh, whereas um, the full model and what is called here the cotangent lift, which is how the basis is computed, uh, maintains the, the Hamiltonian uh, to very high accuracy. Okay, now, what we looked at in some sense was a very simple problem. It's one where the where the one which is so this is called the canonical Hamiltonian problem. So let's instead look at, at a problem which is a little more interesting, also a lot more challenging, which is where it still has the Hamiltonian structure and J is now a Poisson bracket, no not a well they're a Poisson, but they're a Poisson operator. And uh, and that has a, a large number of, of uh, properties that needs to be satisfied. But now the problem becomes complicated for at least two reasons. First of all, the Poisson operator that sits in front, the JN, it may be degenerate, uh, <clears throat> which means that there are additional invariants in the problem that you need to somehow try to satisfy. Um, uh, and at the same time, of course, it is state dependent, so it evolves. Um, and so the question is how to do that. And so what we will do is we will we will split the evolution into a canonical evolution and an evolution of the invariants. Okay, so in order to do that, there are two theorems that, that uh, helps you. So there's the Bose theorem, which says that that for any Hamiltonian system, there is a map that maps the Poisson structure to the canonical structure. So the one where you have the J that we've already seen. Now, of course, you don't know this map a priori and, uh, and it could be very difficult to, to compute. Um, and then there's the Lee-Einstein splitting theorem which says that once you have the Poisson structure locally, you can always break it into a canonical form and a set of invariants. Okay, in other words, you can always take there is a transformation that allows you to bring locally the Poisson operator into the form that is written below. Okay? And those variables in which this happens are called Klebs variables, and the invariants are called the Casimirs. Okay? And, and those of you who have spent a bit of time in sort of mathematical physics knows that these are, are things that people use in a number of different ways. So that's sort of the, uh, that's, if you will, the, the initial approach. Um, so there's a result that you need to, in order to prove that, in fact, if I give you the, the Poisson operator at the discrete level, how do you actually find this decomposition? Can you always find it? So the answer is yes, there's a, a theorem you have to work through. that This can be done. And if you do that, then this basically means that you can now decompose the dynamics into, the, into those uh, parameters, those coordinates that are evolving, and then some that are not. And the ones that are not are then the invariants. Okay, and therefore obviously they don't <clears throat> they don't uh, evolve. So so for the problem where the Poisson operator is constant but non-canonical, then um, this is a relatively simple way because once you have done it like this, then of course the constant the Casimirs are the Casimirs. And the Clef variables can be evolved. Now it's a Hamiltonian problem, which is non-degenerate, and you, you can use the method that uh, that we talked about um, uh, just before. You can prove a number of things uh, for this. It's not so uh, so important. So so an example, for instance, uh, could be the KDV equation. So the KDV equation uh, is written here. Uh, use the solution. That's alpha and mu are parameters. Um, describes uh, waves in uh, in channels. For instance, um, now you can you can write this in Hamiltonian form. You can you can uh, so the the delta is the functional derivative. So you can recover the the KDV through Hamilton's equations like this. Um, 
but of course it's degenerate because there, there's no second equation it's a scalar equation so there are, are uh, invariants and in this case in fact there are two invariants at the discrete level there's the mass and then there's the c2 um, now of course it becomes now critical in order to to really maintain all of this that you also do things correctly in, in time so we will look at two different methods in time so there's the midpoint rule uh, which I think I, I imagine most of you are familiar with so the midpoint rule uh, has the property that it preserves the Poisson structure but it does not exactly preserve the discrete Hamiltonian uh, and then there are another class of methods which are called average vector field methods um, which has the opposite characteristics in other words it, it precisely conserves exactly conserves the discrete Hamiltonian but not the Poisson structure uh, so one could imagine that they would do slightly differently and, and they do but not much so in the left are two solutions um, that are computed um, so n equals n equals a thousand is the number of degrees of freedom in the in the full solution uh, n equals 330 it means 165 basis functions for one variable and for the other variable um, and you can see that in terms of time stepping in the in the in the eyeball norm there's no difference uh, if you look at the errors a little bit, they basically behave more or less the same way. There's a linear growth in time of the error, which is what you would expect for for a time-dependent problem of of with energy conservation. And you can see at the bottom, you can see on the left, this is the midpoint rule. The the green line is the is the error in the Hamiltonian, and sure enough, it it's not constant; it grows ever so slowly. Whereas on the right side, it is the uh, average vector field method. And there you can see indeed the, the um, Hamilton is exactly preserved. But you can look at the Casimirs, which are further down, the different colors, and you can see that for all practical purposes, they are exactly conserved uh, to, machine, to machine zero uh, over the time. Now, if you, if you consider a problem which is still the KDV, but is a bit more complicated, so this is what is called the small dispersion limit. So what what happens when when uh, when mu gets very very small, um, then the equation starts misbehaving and it sets up these uh, wave trains, which which computationally are quite difficult to to compute. Um, and so here again is a is a full solution as well as a reduced uh, model, uh, but we need 240 modes. Okay, so this is. Uh, 1600 in the in the full field and 240 modes in the reduced basis so it's a factor of 10 but it's beginning to hurt a little bit in terms of how uh, large the reduced space is and it begins to be questionable whether there's much to gain um, at the bottom panel um, well the blue at the bottom is the arrow in the Hamiltonian you can see again it is exactly preserved and the arrows in the Casimirs are and for all practical purposes uh, at machine zero. Now, the, the, if, it's, if it's really a time-dependent Poisson operator, then we have to, to evolve the double map, and, and this is not known. Uh, or you cannot, well, if you can write down the map global in time, then of course we're done. Uh, but typically you cannot. So the only option we have is to evolve it so we evolve the map, project the problem into the canonical structure with the Casimir's advance, feedback, evolve the map, and so forth. Um, this is exact to the, up to the arrow um, in the evolution of the map. Um, and uh, for, for, a general, for a general problem, I don't see uh, it's not clear to me how you can do much better, much better than that. Uh, you can prove all poisonous and so on of the of the approach. Uh, just to give you one example, so here's a <clears throat> so this is uh, a, a model that is used for interacting species. Um, again, you can write on can on on, uh, on uh, Hamiltonian form. It's written below, and you can see now you have products of Q and P at different time steps, and it's not. The, the, the Poisson bracket is no longer simply a constant, uh, but rather it's depending on 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 the state variable. Um, 
and there's uh, there's one Casimir. And well, there's several, but there are other there, there are Casimir sub integrals. Uh, but again, it, this this it, it it works very well. You have um, um, basically preservation of of the Casimirs and the Hamiltonian again over uh, long time evolution. Uh, so. So this can be this can be done also for the for the general uh, Hamiltonian problem, but it's considerably more complicated. Um, but the big challenge that sort of uh, is beginning to, to show its face here is that um, that the size of the basis that we need in order to solve these problems um, quickly becomes very large. Uh, this is a known problem. It's associated with the uh, with uh, the decay of the Kolmogorov in with, which talks about how small of a basis you can use to, uh, to represent the manifold. Now, all the methods we have looked at so far, we're trying to do a global representation of the manifold uh, with a global basis. And uh, it is well known that, that uh, especially for transport dominated problems, um, this works quite poorly. Uh, in other words, you have a very slowly decaying Kolmogorov end width, and and therefore uh, the global uh, basis ends up being very large. On the other hand, it is also well known that if you look locally, say for a very short time, uh, you can do very well. So so with a small basis. So, so this suggests that we should see if there is a way in which we can at every time step or every 10 time steps, make sure we have exactly the basis we need. In other words, the basis needs to evolve. Um, and, um, uh, and this poses now additional challenges because this means that we want to do everything that we have done so far with the, with the symplectic basis and, and all of this. The structure must be maintained, uh, but at the same time, the basis must evolve. And also the basis must, it must be adapted. Otherwise, if its base is too rich, we must shrink it. If its base is too large we, or too, too small, we must grow it uh, under these constraints. So, um, so if you look at a problem like this, so here, uh, the only difference from, from this, from what I have shown before is that now, instead of just having a solution uh, Y, on the left-hand side for a particular parameter value, we're now interested in solving the problem for many, many parameter values at the same time. So R is now a matrix rather than just a vector that is 2n uh, tall and p wide, p being the number of, uh, of um, parameter values that we would like to solve for. So this is the problem we'd like to solve. Um, and and the simple idea, which is one that has, of course, been been explored before, is that you say, well, okay, so I'm going to look at my solution as a as a product of uh, of two matrices. One is the basis, uh, and one are the expansion coefficients. Okay, so U uh, is our basis and C uh, expansion coefficients. But the big difference now is that U will evolve. Whereas in everything so far, we've talked about U is a constant, the global, global base. Okay, and U and, and Z has some properties that we need to, to respect. So U is the basis, so it has to be orthogonal, it has to be symplectic, so sometimes called autosymplectic. Um, and Z, has to have full rank. Okay, this is a rank condition. Uh, if it doesn't have full rank, it basically means that you are that that we are we are using uh, a basis which is too rich, at least in exact arithmetic. Uh, so it's it. So that is simply a rank condition. Um, now, the idea of dynamic low rank approximations is one that has been around for for a bit. Uh, for a few years, also for symplectic problems. So there's a paper in 17 or a report in 17 by uh, Mushabash and, and uh, Nobile, where they discuss this in the context of the wave equation. And, uh, and there's a, a report also 
by uh, Pacchettini, where she does it uh, in a more general context. So basically, you can write down equations for set being the expansion coefficient. So you recognize again here we have the, the Hamiltonian problem. And then the basis has to be evolved, has to evolve according to, to this, um, this equation. Okay, y is the Hamiltonian. Um, and, and you can see here that there's sort of, this is where the full rank condition comes in. Because if, 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 if that operator doesn't have full rank, we can't compute this inverse. So, so this means that uh, if that operator becomes extremely ill-conditioned, there are sort of two things to think about. Either you need to regularize it somehow, um, which we typically do, um, or you could simply say, well, if it's, if it's really far from full rank, then it suggests that the basis is too rich, and then you should probably reduce it. So, so reducing the size of the basis is actually pretty simple. You just cut away, and you can, you can, um, you can look at that. Now, to advance in time, I'm not going to have time to do this uh, because this is sort of where it gets a, a little bit involved. But again, if you look at, at uh, the equations in time, then Z again is basically the Hamiltonian problems that needs to be advanced. And then we have to advance this, uh, this, uh, the basis. Now, it turns out that in order to, do, to advance the basis, it is, it is, it is advantageous to introduce a map that maps um, that, so another function v, which is the tangent space, and then a map that connects u to v, and then write the equations for v. Because the tangent space is linear, which means you just have to come up with a time integrator that preserves the linear invariance. And if you can then do this inversion from, from v to, to uh, u, do this evaluation, then in fact, in principle, um, everything is exact. So for this, we use partition Wongakura methods uh, that are developed specifically for this. So the first one, so we have, there has to be a, a, a symplectic part for the, for the uh, Hamiltonian part, uh, which is an implicit one. So it's a, it's a, a Lachandra Gauss type method, Wongakura method. Uh, and then the other one can be a linear explicit method. So there's a linear method for V, um, and then uh, an implicit method for, for the coefficients in order to maintain the structure. Uh, now, what we're left with now is basically the last question, which is, well, okay, so I have all of this, and now I would like to be able to do this in such a way that I can increase or decrease the basis size. Now, decreasing the basis size, uh, we've already talked a little bit about, and basically, uh, you could monitor the rank of set uh, and use this as an indicator to, reduc to reduce u, uh, if need be. Uh, I think in all of the examples I show, uh, the rank only grows, or at least stagnates. But you could increase the basis size. Now, in order to increase the basis size, you need to decide when to do that. And then once you have decided, you need to decide how to grow the basis. So, um, so in this particular work, it's done by, by a residual-based approach, if you will. So you basically write down uh, the, the, uh, the residual at this discrete level, which is zero, like here. And then um, by doing a, a, a Taylor expansion, you can write an, error, an equation for the leading term, at least, for the, for the residual between R and U times set. Okay, R is what you would like. U times set is the, is the, the reduced basis. So this gives you an error. Uh, the error involves the Jacobian. The Jacobian comes in because you have the Ks in the, in the statement. And of course, the Ks depends on the, on the, uh, on the Hamiltonian you're considering, so so you'd have to derive the Hamiltonian, the, the Jacobian. Uh, but nevertheless, this is the error, um, an estimator. And now, just to remember, so now E is going to be a matrix which is going to be 
two n long, n being the number of degrees of freedom in the two solver, and then um, p wide, p being the number of, of uh, parameters. And we use this condition to basically uh, say, well, I am here at t equals zero, and after a certain amount of time steps, I look at how the error grows. And if it has grown, if it exceeds, and here are, some, here are two parameters, and we'll see them when, when I start showing some experiments. Um, so you're basically saying, I, I allow the error to grow a little bit, but if it grows faster than this, then um, I will adapt. And um, so how do you find the, the vector to add? Well, we take the first eigenvector of E, okay? Saying this is the dominating error component, uh, and we add that to the basis. And then uh, there's a there's a, an algorithm for for that, but but uh, that's the basic idea. Okay. Now the computational cost. Well, you can look back and forth, but the thing perhaps to the the the, the, the key thing to to keep in mind here is that uh, n so capital N is the number of degrees of freedom in the full solver. So you have a method here, which is not independent of that, although you would like that. But um, I think we have convinced ourselves that actually this is not possible if you want to do the, uh, the full adaptivity. But it is linear in N. Um, uh, fine, so this is the best we can do. Uh, it is linear in N. So where does it come in? Well, in the rank update, you need it because you need to be able to compute E and second vector um, and, uh, and that. Uh, the evolution map, the, the, the computing this map to the tangent space also scales with N. Uh, and then of course there's the Hamiltonian that needs to be evaluated um, uh, even if you can do uh, various tricks. Um, to the best of our knowledge, there are no hyper reduction methods that um, preserves properties, say, say Hamiltonian exactly, um, except if you uh, consider uh, polynomial nonlinearities, then it can be done. But for general nonlinearity, um, it, it's, we are not aware of any, any way of doing it exactly. Um, the reality is, however, that the approximations, as we've already seen, actually seems to work very well, but they're not exact. So, so here, just to uh, conclude with a few examples, so here's the Schrodinger equation, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So this is a wave problem of relevance to fiber optics and various others. Uh, we look at the parameterized initial conditions, alpha is a parameter and V is a parameter, 10 by 10, so there's 100 parameters. And uh, and you look at the decay of the of the uh, of the singular values either in the global snapshot, which is the black line, or the red one, which is the the um, which is the the rank of the average over time. And uh, so the evolving basis. Okay. And you can see that indeed it is true the conjecture that the local basis, if you know it as it evolves, actually can do a very good job with a very small number of modes. So in this case, say with 20 modes, you can do 10 to the minus five, which with the global basis would need maybe 800 modes. Uh, so here you can really see the advantage of the, of the, uh, of the evolving basis. Um, now, another question is, well, so this whole sort of involved time stepping scheme that is being put into place, does it really work? So here's again for the for the Schrodinger equation, there are different parameters and so on. No, all you need to look at are the scales. Okay, so this is the 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 left one is the orthogonality error for the basis. You can see it's machine zero, and the right one is the error uh, on the symplectic constraint, and again it is machine zero. So the time stepping error, the time stepping approach really do uh, maintain the orthosymplectic uh, structure of the basis as it evolves. Um, in terms of efficiency, so, so runtime, 
So the dashed line is the full, the full solver. The black line is um, an evolving basis, but with, um, but it's not adapted. Uh, and then it depends on how many you start with. And then the lines that are sort of on top of, of each other is um, with the evolving basis. And, and, and the thing to keep it to, to just base perhaps the most important thing to, to, to observe here is that first of all, the basis is very small. And secondly, you gain not two orders of magnitude, but um, uh, maybe a factor of 50 compared to the full model. Uh, the shallow water equation, we've already seen it. The parameter here is the initial conditions. On the left, again, you see the difference in the decay between the global and the local basis. Uh, it's not as dramatic as for the for the shallow water for, for the um, nonlinear swing equation, but nevertheless, it's the same picture. Um, again, you see um, a great advantage in terms of accuracy by having the basis evolve, and the um, here you can also compare with the cost of the reduced order model using a global basis, and you can see that for the reduced order model with a global basis. When, when you have 80 reduced order, when the basis, the size of the basis is 80, it is as costly as the full order model. Whereas with the, uh, with the reduced, with the local model, you can, you can gain, again gain maybe a factor of 50 in, uh, in runtime. Uh, the same thing is true for 2D. Uh, here, uh, 2N, so um, three modes for each variable. For the, for the 2D shallow water equation, the top one is the full, the bottom one is the uh, reduced order model, at least visually, there's no differences. Here, the acceleration is uh, easily two orders of magnitude by, by using the reduced order model because the basis is so small. Uh, now, the, all the different curves, you can see it doesn't really matter much, but all the different curves are different choices of the parameters C and R in the, in the error control. And you can see that it doesn't, it's not particularly sensitive to how we choose these. So you can choose them 1.1, um, 1.2, something like this. Um, just to show you one of these, so here is the error control for the, for the shallow water equation. So um, what they are, so on the top, you have uh, four modes, then it's six modes, and then it's eight modes as you go down. And on the right, you see, as the method adapts, how the basis size grows. Uh, and, and on the left, you see the arrow. So again, the black line is the scheme where you have an evolving basis, but it's not adapting. Uh, and after a while, of course, the arrow grows, uh, and you sort of lose the, the solution in some sense. Whereas with the adapting method, you basically um, control the arrow uh, the best you can. Now the dashed line, which is underneath, is the best you can get in that that is the accuracy of the approximation of the initial condition using the particular basis. Okay, you can't hope to do better than that. Uh, but we can see that in some cases, it's actually uh, pretty good. And certainly the, adaptive, the adapting basis does considerably better. The last example to show you is the Vlasov equation, so the poisson vlasov Now this is, uh, I would say, work in progress, because this is a much more complicated problem. But nevertheless, um, so it's the vlasov poisson it's written like this. Um, so there's a potential phi that drives the, the equation. Um, F, is a, <coughs> F is a distribution. We use a particle cell method. Everything is done in 1D. So one velocity, one space, plus time. Uh, we use a particle cell. Uh, this has relevance to a large number of, of problems, plasma physics, fusion, astrophysics, and so on. And particle cell methods in general are extremely time consuming. So if there is a way of thinking about to reduce these without uh, destroying accuracy, uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting direction. So I'll just show you one example, which is, uh, one which is sort of has a, 
uh, reduced dynamics in the sense that the external electric field is fixed, so there's not a full coupling to the Poisson. But nevertheless, it's a two-stream instability. So on the left, you see the initial distribution, the horizontal in X, the vertical in V. Uh, and basically, so you have two, two streams of particles that are counter-propagating, and you get these characteristic spirals that uh, spin up. Um, and if we do exactly the same thing as, as I have uh, uh, shown, um, so you look at the rank of the global versus the local basis and how it evolves, you see again that there's a substantial potential for, uh, for reducing the overall cost. Uh, it is not as dramatic as in some of the other cases, but this is also only a 1D case. Um, but there's a factor of, of you know, five to six, uh, sometimes more, depending on how accurate you want it, uh, compared to the full solver. Whereas the, the, the global method, basically, there is no advantage to the global method over the, um, over the full solver. So this is still work in progress, and I hope, I hope we can continue this because it, it, it appears to be an interesting direction. So just to summarize, and I think I'm pretty much on time here. So, um, so the development of reduced order models for time-dependent problems is, is more complicated than for more traditional problems. Uh, focusing on Hamiltonian problems gives you a lot of structure that you can use. Many of the problems that we care about can be written as Hamiltonian problems, certainly with the, with the general Poisson operator. Um, and this opens up for perhaps coming up with, with very robust and accurate reduced order models for, uh, let's say, all equations and, and uh, other types of equation. But in order to do this effectively, because of the strong transport components of these types of problems, uh, it has to be done using some sort of local and adaptive basis. Uh, and if you do that, then uh, in fact, we can demonstrate even for, for, for sort of less than trivial problems that there's one to two orders of magnitude um, acceleration to gain uh, for these types of problems. There are still many, many um, uh, things to look at. Uh, it should have said here for nonlinear problems because I just spent 45 minutes telling you about structure preserving reduction methods, but for nonlinear problems, uh, so hyper reduction uh, is still basically not known. Uh, and of course, uh, a more robust uh, error estimation a priori and a posteriori would be, uh, would be nice for these types of problems. So for that, thank you very much for your attention. And if anyone has questions, I'll see what I can do. Okay, thank you, Jan, for this uh, very nice talk uh, using uh, these uh, powerful uh, uh, fundamental tools uh, to, to, to bring an ele elegant uh, discretization method and. Uh, these results are really impressive, even though uh, uh, you are still working on this. It's already quite impressive, the, the quality of the, the results that you had. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, raise your hand as uh, usual. If you know how to do it, there is a, a little uh, uh, hand that you can shake or uh, you can gently enter and ask your question. Uh, of course, I have many questions. So the first one would be on the symplectic uh, EIM. So wh what do you, can, can you give a little further uh, indication on how you, you do this? You said that you had no time to, to really enter into this, but can you say a little bit more about the symplectic empirical interpolation uh, method? Well, so, so, so the thing is that it's not, it's not symplectic. Mm -hmm. It's not so, symplectic because you, you, you so they, they uh, in order for it to be symplectic, you would have to find a very special basis that 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 maintains the, this gradient structure, okay. and uh, and the, 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 the standard I'm that doesn't do that. Okay. So so you, so that, now now the reality is that if you choose your basis well, if you choose it accurately, then actually I mean, so the reality is it works very well. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you can, but it is not it is not exactly preserving. Okay, but you, do you have a way to measure the, the, the fact that it is a, a good approximation or not in, in the symplectic way? You, you say that it's not, uh, 
it's, it's not simplectic, so uh, that it's, it's nevertheless working very well. So do you have a, a way to, 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 to measure the quality and uh, how to correct it if, uh, if it's not yeah, how to correct it? I don't know how to correct it, but I mean, you can, you can look at the approximation of, of it and you can, you can see what you would like and what you should be getting and what you get. So you can, you can measure this. I mean, so let's say you're running your code, you can certainly measure it, but, but how to correct for it, I, it it's, I, this I don't know. Ah, okay, okay. I thought you, you, you had a, a way to, to improve. No. Uh, okay. No. okay. No, I can just observe, we can just observe that if your base yeah. is, is rich enough, then I, I mean, it works very well. Okay. But okay. It's, it, you cannot claim that it's exact. Okay. Uh, Bruno? You have yes. A do, do you hear me? Yes, yes, of course. That's fine. Okay. Hi, Ayan. So, I so my know. question, what's going on if you want to, if I should need to incorporate some details in your Hamiltonian structure, like a boundary condition, if you have problem in the bounded domain, you have not commented on that. What, what's going on if you, if you need boundary conditions? Does it well, change something or? Well, it, I mean, so, so, so it depends on what kind of boundary conditions you, you, you want to bring into the, to the game, right? I mean, if, let's say you have hard walls. Yes. Then, of course, you still have uh, energy conservation. Okay. At least you could imagine you still have energy conservation. And then uh, I, I would, we haven't done it, but I would speculate that everything uh, would work out in a, in a similar fashion. Now, okay. if you have some sort of dissipative boundary condition, you know, an, an, an external boundary condition or, or something like that, then, of course, the structure changes, the problem changes nature. And now it is no longer, a, you know, strictly energy preserving. And then you get into sort of a business of dissipative Hamiltonian system. Yes. Now, we have done this in the past uh, for problems where, where the dissipative force, if you will, is linear. So mm -hmm. if it's linear, it turns out that you can, you can, you can embed your, your uh, dissipative Hamiltonian problem into, into a larger problem, which is Hamiltonian. Ah, okay. And then you can solve it there. And, and they, 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 the intuitive way of thinking of it is that at every point in space, you attach a string. And the, dissip and the dissipation throws energy into the string. Okay, yes. So the global problem is still Hamiltonian. But the, the, the sub-problem that you care about is now dissipative. Okay. And then you have a larger problem, which is Hamiltonian, and then you can use your machinery for that. Okay? Okay. So, so this is one way of doing it, uh, but it only works for, for a particular type of, of, of dissipative force. Uh, if it's a nonlinear force, uh, you know, a nonlinear dissipative mechanism, then... Uh, I don't think it, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I've known how to do that. Okay, thank you. So a boundary condition, for instance, I would, I would, I would think if it's a reasonable boundary condition that you can formulate that as a, as a, as a, as a linear distributive operator, you know, as a, you know, an open boundary condition or something like that. And then I think it, then, then I'm confident it can be done. But if it's more complicated than that, then I don't know. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Benoit? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your talk, by the way. Very, very interesting. Uh, I was wondering, this, uh, this version of the shallow water equation with the potential flow, uh, can, it be, can you come back to the conservative quantities to, to redo the same analysis after you know what you have been doing? Uh, I guess you lose uh, the, the Hamiltonian structure uh, if you go to the conservative quantities and uh, the momentum. Yes, but yes, I do. Any way to, to, to see w what would give the same, uh, the same approach? So you're saying uh, you, 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 you would like to look at the shallow water equation on non-Hamiltonian form? Yes, I would like to go beyond the know, can, I, can, I, can I use this machinery in some, in some way uh, without expressing the equations in Hamiltonian form. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so... I would like uh, to go beyond the shocks, beyond the, the singularities, and to yeah, keep yeah. The, the usual entropy. Yes, yes. So, uh, so the, the short answer is I don't know. We haven't looked at that. 
I don't know. And I, I think this is going to be tricky, but who knows? And, uh, and this, of course, would be, uh, this would be great, right? Because if this was possible, it means that you could, you could augment, let's say, a solver for the Euler equations uh, in the conserved variables, but, but, but still somehow make sure that uh, things behave. The only way I know how to do this for reduced order models is to write at the cons for, for the conserved variables to write everything on skew symmetric form. Then you can prove that if you build a reduced order model of the skew symmetric form, you maintain, ac you maintain stability. But, but, but you don't have all this uh, Hamiltonian yeah. machinery. Yeah, that's it, yes. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, other question? Okay, I, I have another one. Um, so, uh, when you spoke about the, the extension to more complex uh, uh, Hamiltonian system, you, you, you introduced the notion of the Darbu uh, uh, operator. Uh, yeah, Darbu map, yeah. Darbu, Darbu map. And uh, so, you first presented the results on uh, KDV, and then you said, uh, for more general case, uh, the Darbu uh, as an evolution structure. So this means that for KDV, the Darbu is, is, does not evolve in time. It's steady? Yes, yes. Okay. So this is a yes. very particular case in which, uh, okay. Yes, so, so, the, so the reason I showed that example is because this is an example of a Hamiltonian system that is degenerate. But the Darbu map is actually constant. Okay. So no, it's, it's, it's a priori known. Okay. But, okay. It, but it's degenerate. So you have, you have, Casimir invariants, whereas for the Voltaire uh, interacting species, there um, the Darbu map evolves, and you have to you have to compute it on the fly because it's not it's not known how to uh, how to uh, recover that map for you know global. Okay. Global time. And, and so the, the, the theory on this is constructive, so you can use uh, the theory to, to build the, the Darbu map? Yeah. Yeah, ah, okay. I don't know what I should have. And so the, the number of Casimir then is constant, is, uh, is uh, finite, it's small, or like in Hamiltonian system? So I don't know what the difference, uh, is there a link between Casimir and the invariant, for instance? It's, it's about uh, yes, there are. I mean, so the Casimirs are, are are invariants, right? But but they, but of course it depends on. So it depends on the problem and so on. So yeah, you know, for for let's see, it's known that for the Euler equations in two D, you have infinitely many Casimirs. Ah, uh, infinitely many Casimirs. Okay. So. Uh, but of course, at so the discrete it, level, you don't have infinitely many. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have yeah. a, 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 a large number. number. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so you, yeah. you have to you, you have to uh, monitor every Casimir, or only monitoring few of them is enough. Well, so what happens is that you you have the the the, the uh, so the simplest cases you have the, the the Poisson operator, and and you you put it on canonical form, and then there will be a number, and then basically you will have an evolving component, and you will have a number of Casimirs that do not involve evolve. Mm -hmm. And this will not change. I mean, once you have chosen n, the number of degrees of freedom, then this will not change. This is fixed. Yeah. And then you just don't evolve, and, and those you just do not evolve because you okay. because you know that they're invariants. Okay. Okay. So so so, so yes. Yeah, so this this is uh, an exercise that you have to do for every for every problem. Uh, and and for some, I mean, for for fully integrable systems, you will have in the continuous limit, you will have infinitely many invariants. Right. So so these are yes, these are these are related. Okay. And so this, uh, if you want to increase the accuracy, of course, you increase the the cost also by increasing the number of Casimir to be to be taken care of. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how does this uh, expand the complexity? The cost uh, of the. But it doesn't. It doesn't really because you because you have. Um, you you okay. So so if the map is evolving, then of course it's complicated because the 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 you know the nature of the Casimirs may change and so they are problem dependent. Yeah. In the simplest yes. case where 
you have a, a PDE where 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 the Poisson operator is fixed, then basically you you bring it into this form where you have a part of the which are the Klebs variables are evolving as a canonical Hamiltonian problem, and the rest of the variables are just simply not evolving. So so you do this. Uh, you do this, you know, if the map doesn't evolve, you do this a priori and then you solve. So it doesn't it doesn't have a large impact on the on the cost. Okay, I see. Thank you. Uh, Olga, you raised your hand at some point. I saw. Hi, uh, Yvonne. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, Jan just answered to my question. I, I was wondering whether uh, what was happening for the KDV equation, which is an equation which has an infinite number of Casimirs. But so the question just uh, got answered. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jan, uh, particularly for this uh, very nice presentation. And uh, so we'll meet uh, next week for, I think, what will be the, the last uh, uh, seminar of the of the period before the before the summer. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye Jan. bye. Thank you. Bye bye.